So like I'm here to tell you a story of uh, how we took a manual process that involved many, many humans and automated pretty much all of it. And also how we fucked up and learned from it. <laughs> because that's something we do a lot at Facebook. Um, hey, I'm Anirudh, like Avleen said, and I'm a production engineer at Facebook. My team's called Rackstorm. It doesn't have much to do with racks or storms, but uh, yeah, that's the name we chose. Uh, I'm here to talk about hardware decommissioning today. Uh, we will go over the need for it, and we will take a quick walk down memory lane and look at how we proceeded to automate it. And finally, I'll share our vision for the future in this space. Not as sexy as Oculus, but uh, you know, we're all SREs. Uh, Facebook is huge. Uh, what started as a simple website that was run out of a dorm room is now a vast ecosystem spanning continents. And as the company grows older, so does its hardware. I mean, second law of thermodynamics, you can't eliminate wear and tear. As new locations come online and new hardware becomes available, older locations have hardware that reaches the end of its shelf life or becomes obsolete and needs to be decommissioned. With smaller presence in a data center, this would be relatively easy. You just find the machines that need to be retired you identify the services that run on them, find replacements for those machines, and then of course you ping on calls and tell them, hey, you need to migrate, uh, we're taking these things down. But Facebook has 14 geographic locations. Uh, we had 12 when I submitted the abstract, and that's what is in your program, but we have 14 now. And I'm allowed to say we have tens of thousands of servers. Uh, that's a lot of machines with limited lifespans. Uh, Production engineers and software engineers can't afford to spend all of their on-call shifts just dealing with service migrations. And since we deal with machines in bulk, that means that many machines expire at the same time. It's not a rolling process. Like We have a huge batch of them happening all the time. Uh, this is a good time for me to tell you how we used to do decommissions. It was all spreadsheets. Uh, spreadsheets all the way down. And we had to get rid of them. I mean. Who even likes spreadsheets here? We're all SREs, come on. Uh, but yeah, until recently, decommission events were small enough and few and far between enough that they were a manual effort. Uh, the subprocess that has the most moving parts in a decommission is service migration. Uh, you move your services from old hardware to new hardware so that you can junk the old. The rest we can consider as constant factors from unprovisioning to physical removal of the hardware. So that doesn't really matter. Uh, it does, but <laughs> there are many different services that run on our machines, and each is managed by the team that created it. Decommissioning a set of these machines means that we need to migrate all of those services. And in the past, there was no one place to keep track of ongoing decommission efforts. For a, given for a given decom event, program managers maintained spreadsheets of affected services, and they kept everything in there, ranging from the uh, list of replacements, identifying which machines to give to which services, to even just tasking the service on calls with actually performing the migrations. But of course, on calls have shit to do. They have other things, other fires to deal with. And there were a whole lot of messenger threads and groups posts and other forms of begging and pleading to move the fuck off of old hardware so that we could finally unplug it and move real hardware out from the loading dock into the data center. Uh, the actual steps were often just like a script that an on-call would run. I mean, it was so easy. Uh, but sometimes there were steps handed down the generations in the form of playbooks. Or worse, there was just someone on the team who had them in their brain as tribal knowledge. I mean, who here has a team member who knows something that nobody else does? Uh, pretty much all of us, right? Yeah. So like these steps are fairly simple. Uh, you just set up replacements, let your job scheduler know, hey, these things exist, start using them. And for the retiring machines, you stop the flow of production traffic, you move any state or any data that you have on them, stop jobs and make the job scheduler forget that these machines exist. This was not fast enough, and every last, uh, every last batch of retiring machines was held up by the last service to get out of them. The manual process was also fairly error prone, but what was worse, these last services that were being held, that were holding machines back, 
They were consuming power and data hall space without providing anything in return. And error prone, we had so many outages, uh, services that were incorrectly drained, hardware that got unplugged without draining them, services reusing servers that they had already drained. I mean, program managers just forgot to send them to the guys who unplug it, and services started reusing them, thinking, hey, these things are just sitting idle, let's use it. So finally, when they did get unplugged, they didn't get drained. The only lesson we learned was humans are human and can make mistakes. Great lessons, right? Uh, and this was an already slow process. It took us months. And it was only going to get slower as our data center footprint grows. Uh, 14 locations. This process had to be improved. Uh, and the way we chose to improve it was to build a UI. Uh, we first built a UI to verify for program managers to verify and kick off batches of migrations, uh, just make sure that every the right set of machines are being retired and the right set is replacing them. At first, this UI only led to creating tasks to service on calls. In parallel, we were working on a framework that would support running migration handler jobs. You give it a set of hardware and a set of hardware that's replacing it. It will look up what kind of migration handler to run and it will spawn a job and give it those two sets of assets. In case of failures, this framework would bail out to task the service on call through a state machine that we built around the internal ticketing system. Uh, a migration job failure would trigger the start state from where the service on call would get a ticket. They could trigger retries of the automation, or they could just manually do it and mark the ticket as complete. We quickly realized that we could just plug this thing in into the existing UI that we had because nobody had automation yet. And this was an error that would result in the same task ticket to service on calls that program managers would click to create manually anyway. This helped us get services on board much faster. You see, every time a service uh, suddenly got a migration handler, the framework would no longer fail out to a task but would, instead send, uh, but would instead run the automation. There was nothing different from the UI that program managers had to do. I mean, they aren't engineers. We don't want to overload them with new things to do. And this helped us iterate much faster than we expected. At the heart of it, we designed the migration handler prototype to take in tool sets, as I said earlier. One of machines that are being retired and one of machines that are replacing them. At the end of the migration handler job, we were expecting that the retiring machines would no longer be in use. And before the migration handler job, we were going to provision the replacement machines, make sure they're ready to use with the right OS and the right set of software. Within the migration handler itself, services were free to write any code that would get the fucking job done. Uh, we wrote a few migration handlers as common use cases for people, which services could either reuse as is, or they could use as patterns for designing their own migration handlers. And the greatest boon for us was that task state machine, because it was amazing. Uh, we first attempt to run migration automation. And if there is no automation, or if the automation fails, we send a ticket to the on-call. They can either unblock the automation or fix it, and retry, or they can just do the migration manually and tell the framework, hey, look, I'm done with this. Let's just move on to the next stage. And that's what we built. Uh, it was pretty cool. Subsequently, we added other pieces to the puzzle, though. Uh, we added a way for, am I clicking this right? No, OK, cool, yeah. Uh, we added a way for services to automate the placement of replacement capacity orders for them to tell us how much replacements we need. We added a workflow system to tag and keep track of assets that are going through the whole decom process. And my personal favorite, we added a system that I am going to call the glue factory or the robot butcher that uh, takes machines that have been migrated out of and unprovisions them. It just utterly wipes them up, uh, cleans them out, whatever. And that's how we fucked up. Uh, we caused sevs. Uh, so, yeah, uh, one of our first migration handlers was for a cache service, because that's the safest place to start, right? Uh, there was a big defect in the draining logic that didn't really get triggered that often. 
and it didn't get caught in testing. Uh, so one fine migration event day, it ended up that uh, machines were sent in production to uh, the glue factory while they were still in use. The glue factory, of course, didn't check if machines had been drained because well, who sends machines there without draining them? And uh, it just quietly killed them. Boom. Uh, <laughs> Production was not noticeably infected, thankfully. We didn't have to go to Mark Zuckerberg and tell him, hey, we fucked up. Uh, the site didn't go down, the site didn't even slow down, but we had taken live machines serving user traffic and slaughtered them. Kill the fuck out of them. <laughs> but uh, we learned some things. We ended up pushing migration handler writers to set uh, their retiring machines at the end of a job to a new state that we added to the hardware management system, returned. We made sure that job schedulers would not run services on returned assets, and we asserted that at the end of a migration handler run, retiring assets have to be in the state, or else we forced it to go into failure mode and sent a ticket to the service on call. Speaking of tickets to on calls, that's how we created our second sev, because you see, humans don't read. Uh, and thankfully, or not thankfully, unfortunately, we had not yet productionized the fixes from the cash killer sev, so we weren't protected from this one either. To recap, we had changed the entire service migration process, uh, just like completely. And from a service owner's perspective, these changes were fairly inconsequential at first glance, but we had in fact pulled the tablecloth off from under a whole lot of expensive fine china with dinner still on them. And uh, yeah, that's kind of a messy thing to do, but we did it. Uh, so one fine day, a service on call receives a ticket requesting them to manually migrate from a bunch of their machines. And without really completely reading the ticket, they just probably read the title, I guess. Uh, and they did what they usually did. They triggered a long and slow drain process and they marked the ticket as completed without knowing that there's a robot butcher waiting down the line. And of course, the robot butcher killed the fuck out of those machines before the drain could complete. Because yeah, that's what it does. Uh, we did have a clear, concise description in the task that said something very polite, like, uh, please complete migrating out of these machines and then only mark this ticket as completed. But what we should have had was a blaring title with klaxon emoji saying, warning, please read this, the process has changed. And we should have also had an addendum saying, at the end of this, if you mark the ticket as completed, your retiring machines will be nuked and you will not get them back. We could have done a whole lot better at communicating, uh, both when we launched the process as an announcement to all the service owners, and also in every single ticket we sent to service on calls. Because if you introduce, when you introduce humans into a process that's otherwise automated, you make sure that they know the consequences of their actions because otherwise they're just going to treat the new process like they did the old. Well, uh, things that go quite swimmingly because I'm standing here talking about it to you and on a slide referring to the future. Uh, so yeah, we survived. Uh, we found that the migration handler pattern was fairly uniform. You add replacements to a service, you drain the retiring machines, and then you remove the retiring machines from the service. We decided to start supporting add and remove capacity use cases as separate handler types, which you could compose into a migration handler or which you could run individually. So this addition of uh, add and remove capacity support led us to seek use cases for our framework beyond just hardware decoms. We were able to serve teams that came to us looking for an automated way to turn up or turn down services for things like new hardware testing or disaster recovery. We were able to support teams that wanted to do large scale one time migrations like from bare metal to virtual machines. And most interesting, there's an ongoing effort to continuously run migrations across our fleet so that we can uh, balance the usage of shared resources such as power and network, and eliminate hotspots in the data center where these resources get guzzled.
we also realized uh, that when we do these migrations in batches, many of these machines are co-located on the same physical rack. And while we are waiting for the entire rack to drain, some machines would have already drained, some machines would have not drained. So we st ended up running some stateless services on the machines that have already been drained with the caveat that these machines can go away at any time, we can just suddenly kill them and you'd need, you should not require a drain before we do that. So we were extracting every last drop of compute juice out of our hardware before we were unplugging it. In the future, we are also planning to work with the team that runs hardware maintenance automation and we are going to do something like if there is a service that's blocking a maintenance, because they can't sustain the temporary loss of their machines, we are going to provide them additional capacity outside the maintenance scope, migrate them onto it, and then let the maintenance team take down the original machines and do those maintenances. Service migrations, we have been running them automatically in production for hardware decoms for over a year now. Shipping features early and often has helped us gain a whole lot of feedback throughout the development and improvement process, and it has made rollout much easier for us. Now that most of our fleet has service migration automation, we are seeing a drastically reduced human involvement, way fewer errors, and more consistency and speed in service migrations and the overall hardware decom process. With uses beyond just decoms, such as data center rebalancing and hardware maintenance unblocking and disaster recovery, this has proven to be a great investment for us and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Thanks for listening. Uh, it's question time. Does anyone have questions? I can run mics over. No, you're all thinking about lunch. Aha, one right here. You know, what kind of time cycle, uh, time scale are you talking about in terms of the drains? Are you like looking at like days or weeks? I'm just thinking from the standpoint of why not make glue factory have a 15 minute sleep at the beginning of it <laughs> instead of putting the big klaxon thing in uh, yeah, as no, an option? Uh, so it depends on the answer to most of my, the answer that I provide to most cases is just it depends. Uh, but following up, uh, on that, uh, some drains took something like the order of minutes. Some drains where like you have a lot of stateful services, uh, databases and so on. Those took hours, days, weeks even. So we could not really put just a sleep on the glue factory and be like, hey, this is going to be okay. Uh, we had to actually force the process to wait for the drain to complete. My, make sure that the, there is a step in the automation where the service owners will set the assets to return. And then once we have done that, that's a go ahead for us to kill them. Nope, oh, one back here. Nope. I guess this is really the other end of the decom process, but roughly how long does it take you to go from we have hardware to a machine is up and running? Sorry, I didn't quite get it. Are you asking about how long it takes us to go from new to take this machine away? From, from yeah, uh, a vendor or however you get your hardware, hardware arrives at the data center to the box is built and you can actually start shifting things onto it. I'm not really sure I can answer that. It's on the order of a few years, uh, but yeah, like newer hardware keeps coming up. Uh, it's faster, it consumes less power. So sometimes we want to get older hardware out faster so that we can reuse that space. Can't give you actual numbers though, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>